chapter 3, the first 11 verses. But what we're doing here this afternoon is we're interpreting the Bible. And interpreting the Bible is, a, is an interesting subject. Um, and there's all sorts of different ways of looking at interpreting the Bible. There's all sorts of things to consider. But I want to suggest to you that when we are going to interpret the Bible, there are three areas that we need to look at. The first one is what does the passage that we're studying mean at the, in the context of the time and the civilization, the place that it was written? Now, when you and I read the Bible, we read the Bible through the lens of our, of our perspective here in 2023. But when the New Testament, when this book was written, it was within the first hundred years after Christ. Okay, And we can all understand that society was somewhat different there. If you read through the Bible, you'll see that, that Paul and, and various other writers are, are saying things to us and sometimes telling us what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And there's a fairly famous um, passage that talks that where the Apostle Paul asks the ladies in a particular church to dress more modestly. Now, when you and I think about that, we think that a modest dressing is wearing clothing that shows a bit too much. Sorry? But in, those, in, in that culture and time, what immodest dressing was, the immodest dressing that the Apostle Paul was talking to was the amount of jewellery that the women wore in church. Because the amount of jewellery that you wore reflected your social position in society. And one of the unique things about a church is that you can find people from all different strata of society in it. You can find the very rich and the very poor and people right in between. So it's p the potential back then was for the women from uh, uh, the poorer parts of society to be embarrassed by the jewellery that the women were wearing from the I I more well-to-do parts of society. Now, when we know that, when we understand that, it throws a different light on that passage, doesn't it? So we need to consider the context that that scripture was written into and that it was speaking into. The second thing is, what is it literally saying to us? Well, in that case, dressing modestly is still probably a good thing regardless of how we interpret modesty. But the third area that we need to look at is what the Holy Spirit is saying to us through that passage. Now, if you've been a Christian for a while, you have most likely experienced when you've been reading the Bible or you've been in a service or a meeting where the Bible has been uh, read out to you and it's like just God speaks to you through the, that passage. And that's what we might call a, a, an enlightened or a rhema word. It's where the Holy Spirit touches the word and he says something to you. And that can be a bit different again. But the one thing that we must know about these three different interpretations is that none of them contradict each other. So if you're reading a, a, a passage in the Bible and you feel that uh, God is saying to you through it that you should go out and kill somebody, I uh, just want to know you to know that that's in contradiction with everything else. And Mark might get a bit excited, OK? Uh, <laughs> You know, he would want to come and sort of help you in the error of your ways. Uh, but you know what I mean? Now, if you get something like that, it's clearly not God talking to you. It's the other camp, okay? You need to watch where you're getting your influence from. But God never contradicts himself. The Bible tells us that God is not a man that he should lie. So that means that he will not lie to us. He will not uh, contradict himself. Did you know the major difference between the Muslim faith and the Christian faith is simply this. As Christians, we know that God cannot lie. The Muslims teach that Allah does lie. And therein rests the difference. Anyhow, back to what we were going to go to. So we're looking at the first 11 verses of Philippians chapter 3. Let me read them to you. It says this. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. 
For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, whose glory in Christ, whose glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone thinks that he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now in the Bible, the online Bible that I was using that I, I copied and pasted this section of scripture out of, it heads it all up. The, right, the, the title it gives it is Righteousness Through Faith in Christ. And I'm so glad that we can only attain right, righteousness in faith through, through Christ. Because if I was trying to attain it through good works, I'd be stuffed. <laughs> I'm just not good enough. I'm not that good. I have a healthy ego, but I'm not that good at, at being faultless. So I would fail that test. So just knowing that I am saved by faith through grace, or the other way around, if you like, through grace by faith, that's just such a load off me. And it should be a load off you because it tells you that you cannot earn salvation. And if you don't have to earn salvation, you don't have to try for it. And not having to do that is wonderful because Jesus did it all for you and I. The deal is done. The deed's been signed. The transfer's been made. Jesus paid the price for you and I. And we are saved because of what he did. The Bible calls Jesus our Redeemer and a Redeemer in the scriptural context is somebody that pays a debt that they did not owe. There's that old hymn, he paid a debt he did not owe. And that's literally what a Redeemer is. Jesus paid the debt that we owe because of our sins for us. And he paid it completely so that when we accept the offer of salvation that he gives us, we don't have to worry about it again. And that is just a load off. Seriously. Why would you want to try and earn salvation when it's already been done for you? Why would you want to try and strive for that? Because we have righteousness that comes through faith. The Bible says that faith is when we, is when we call things that are not as though they were. And we get that when we get a word spoken to us by God, that rhema word that I mentioned earlier, and he gives us saving faith and we know that we can be born again by saying yes. So that which is not, which is our lack of salvation, becomes true because we have faith and we believe what Jesus did for us. So I've broken this passage up into to four sections. And the first one's the first two verses. And it says again, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. So clearly, Paul has already spoken to them about these issues that he wants to address in this passage. And he's saying he's more than happy to say it again. Who's a parent in the room? Most of us are. Who's had to tell your kids more than once about something? Come on, be honest, Mark. <laughs> I have three children. They are wonderful kids. They have not caused Betty and I anywhere near the grief and pain that I know some parents have had from their children. But we had to tell them multiple times about many things, didn't we, love? 
particularly when you're saying, don't do this because you could get hurt or this could happen to you and we want to keep you from harm. So Paul is assuming a parental role in this context, you might say. He said, let me just remind you of this so you guys don't get hurt, you don't go astray, something goes wrong. He's happy to do it. And in the next verse, he gets, he really sort of, his language amps up a bit. He says, watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. And he's actually speaking about those Jewish Christians that have come down, trying to tell every, all the men, the Gentile men, that they needed to be circumcised. Speaking as a Gentile male, I'm quite happy that Paul's saying you didn't have to worry about that. Okay. The thought makes me nervous. Sorry? Oh, just, you just keep away. <laughs> you know, I, I, have this, I have a verse, this averse reaction to my own blood. I go white and I faint. Right, just, so let's just. <laughs> but you know, th this parallel still plays out in, in our society today, in the church today. There are people who will come and do, tell us that we need to do extra things to be saved. That might not be being circumcised, it might be something else, it might be that you must attend church on Saturday or or, or you must uh, do this particular thing, or you must give money to this, or you must, you know, spend five hours every Saturday praying, or, you know, insert the relevant thing here. But anybody that wants to add to how we are saved, they're a mutilator of the flesh as far as Paul is concerned. The Bible is really simple and clear about being born again. When I was an aged care chaplain, <clears throat> there was this gentleman in there and he was bedridden, he'd lost a leg to cellulitis. And um, when I first started in this particular aged care home as a, the chaplain, I went into his room and I introduced myself and said, hi, I'm Peter, I'm the new chaplain. And he said, uh, you know, my name is, I'll just call him Fred in this uh, story because I'm not supposed to give away names. And Fred said to me, I'm fine. My, my uncle's a Roman Catholic priest. It's all sorted. I don't want to talk about religion. And I said, OK, Fred, that's fine. But, but, you know, we can still be friends. I'm here. You're here. We might as well get along. And so over the next 18 months or so, we developed quite a friendship. I'd go up and see him every now and then. And, you know, we'd tell each other stories like men do. And we learnt a bit about each other. And I learnt that he, his wife had predeceased him. He actually had her ashes in an urn in his room on the top shelf, which was a little bit different for me. Um, and yes, he had an uncle who had been a Roman Catholic priest in, in Goulburn. His uncle had studied theology at St Paul's in, in Rome. And uh, his uncle had married them and he thought that he had all that sort of thing sorted out. And I went in to see him one day and he said, oh, Peter, he said, yeah, my 90th birthday is early next year and I'm just so looking forward to turning 90. And, you know, we had a bit of a chat about that. And um, a little while after that, uh, he, he, well, Fred had always been a sort of a cheery bloke, you know, always happy to see you have a chat, one of those kind of fellas. And all of a sudden he's just got very serious and I found out from one of the carers that uh, the, uh, the speech pathologist had been in to see him because he was having issues with swallowing and had put him onto what they call a minced moist diet. That's where they mince everything up, they run it through a blender. It doesn't taste good and if you enjoy your food it just takes all the pleasure out of it. Okay. And so he, all of a sudden, he just suddenly lost interest in living. And anyhow, he ended up in palliative care. He ended up in a coma. And I used to go in to see him fairly regularly, and I'd just sit down next to his bed and talk to him uh, because you know, I understood that whilst he was m maybe in a coma, he could still hear me and um, understand what I was saying. And, and one day, he was up on the top floor of where I worked, I went up to see him and the nurse that, she's like the sergeant major in the place, she ran the floor. There was an RN that thought she did, but 
Cheryl did really run the floor. And she said, Peter. I said, yes, Cheryl. She said, you've got to talk to Fred and tell him it's okay to go. His, his, his family's okay with it. It's okay to go. You've got to talk to the big fella upstairs and ask him to take Fred home. And I was kind of a bit uncomfortable with that thought. I mean, you know, people passing away was something that I dealt with in a regular basis in that place. But I'd never been asked to pray for somebody to die. It's, I've sort of prayed the opposite, that they would hang around longer. I said, just leave it with me, Cheryl. And I walked in to see Fred and I sat down next to his bed and started talking to him. And then I... I uh, the thought just dropped into my, my mind that maybe the reason he was hanging on was because he was uncertain about what came next. And we've all heard the story of the thief on the cross uh, that Jesus said, you'll be welcome this day with me in paradise. Now, he didn't tick any of the boxes that we might like people to jump through to become a Christian. He just accepted the offer of salvation. He called on the name of the Lord. So I said, Fred, I don't know if you're hanging on because you're not certain what's coming next, even though he tried to tell me when I first met him that he was okay with what was coming next. I said, no, you can't speak right now, but you can call on God and ask him to save you. You can do that in your mind. And if you do, God will save you and your future will be sorted out. And I talked to him for a few more minutes and said, Fred, I'll come back and see you tomorrow. So I walked out of the room and went about the rest of my day. And when I came in the next morning, there was an email in my inbox telling me that Fred had passed away and that he'd passed away peacefully. Now, I believe that in that moment that he called upon the name of the Lord. It's that simple. Called upon the name of the Lord and asked him to save him and went home to be with our Saviour. See, that's just simple. Salvation is simple. If anybody tries to make it complicated, don't take any notice of that. God doesn't add anything to salvation. One of my favourite verses is Romans chapter 10, verse 9, where it says, If you believe in your heart that God has raised Christ from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, then you shall be saved. My hope rests on that. Nothing I did, everything Jesus did. So don't let anybody add to the message of salvation. Don't let anybody add to the methodology of salvation. Resist those mutilators of the flesh. What powerful language. The next section I've got is the verses 3 through to 6. Let me read them to you. It says... For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, Persecuting the church as for legalistic righteousness, faultness. Paul was saying he was pretty good. Paul had studied under a Pharisee named Gamaliel, his, his theological lecturer, you might say. And apparently, if you're going to be trained as a Pharisee, Gamaliel was the guy to, get, to sit under, to have as your teacher, to have as your mentor. And we know that Paul was zealous uh, pursuing what he believed was of God, but he, ha he had realised by this point that it was all worth nothing. Even though he ticked all the boxes, it didn't save him. He knew that it was faith in Christ Jesus. Um, and I mean, we all probably know people that we would consider better than us, who, who do more good things than us. The Bible teaches us that our righteousness is as filthy rags. It counts for nothing compared to Jesus Christ. That's why we need Jesus to be born again. That's why we need to believe in him. So legalism won't save you. It's the position of your heart that does. 
when you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that Christ has risen from the dead, that's your heart needs to be in that place. Your heart needs to be trusting Jesus for your salvation. Your heart needs to understand that nobody else can do it for you, that we are completely and utterly without hope unless we are born again, unless we have that truth in our hearts. So then verses 7 through to 9 says this, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. So he's realised, he, he's saying here that, you know, all my efforts to be good, to fulfil the law, are of no avail, but that it, it was, it's faith in Jesus Christ that saves me. See, that's, that's what we need, is faith in Jesus Christ. You know, so many, so many people want to do this and they want to do that, and it bothers me at times when I see what people want to add to our faith. We get people that want to... Uh, um, you know, they want to observe some of these old customs. You know, Paul says that when you start, if you want to go back to following the law of the Jews, you've got to follow the whole lot. You can't just take a section out of the Torah and say, this is what we'll do. You've got to do the whole lot. We don't need to do the whole lot. Our, our position comes from not what, from we, what, not what we do, but from what we believe and where our heart is. We have to understand that we can't save ourselves. I know I'm repeating myself a bit on that subject this afternoon, but I think there's people here that, that need to hear that. You need to understand you can't earn your salvation. There's nothing that you can do on this earth that will get you saved except to believe in Jesus Christ. It's that simple. Paul understood that all his good works were not of any profit to him. Paul then goes on to say in verses 10 and 11, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Now our hope, our trust in God is that we understand that we'll be resurrected from the dead. That's what the Bible tells us. That's God's promise to us. Jesus told us that if we followed him, if we chose to follow him, that we would know trouble. He does not promise that it'll be an easy life. He promises that we will have hard times because that's simply just the nature of, of this world. But one of my favourite parts out of Psalm 23 is that those verses where it says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, yet I will fear no evil, for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. How good is that? You know, when we get into strife, and if you're anything like me, you've said, God, get me out of this, fix this problem, heal me, whatever it might be, you know, help me in this, you know, pull me out of my mess. And God says, no, nah, sorry, not going to do that. And you know, God, what are you doing? Take me out. And God says, no, I'm going to walk with you through this mess, through this situation, because I have a plan for you. I want to use this to make you more like Jesus. See, God's plan when we are born again is to make us more like Jesus. That's what the very definition of holy is, is to be like Jesus. Because he was the only holy person who'd walked the earth. He wants us to be like Jesus. And you know, the devil might have plan A to mess up your life. But God has plan B, and that's to work everything together for good for those that love and honour the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the devil wants to take us down, but God wants to build us up. God wants to make us more like Jesus. So the devil might think that he has the best plan, but the reason God has plan B is because B stands for better and best and all those kinds of words, right? God has plan B, the best plan for you and I, because he's going to use it to shape us into the man or woman that he has made us to be. 
And look, honestly, I don't know why. I mean, you know, uh, we've all gone through things in this life and you think, when will this end? How, God, how are you working something out in me? I remember Betty and I, uh, a number of years ago, I bought, st- bought this little business in Canberra and it's the only business I've ever had fail, but it failed. And, and, and I was complaining to God about it quite strongly. <laughs> and, you know, saying, God, I did this because I thought you wanted me to do this and I haven't succeeded in it and why haven't we succeeded and I've done everything that I thought you wanted to me do, you wanted me to do. And, you know, rah, 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 you can imagine probably some of the things that I said. And God said to me, son, he said, you might call it a failure, but I call it a success because I've used it to teach you what I wanted you to learn. That shut me up. I stopped complaining straight away. Well, almost straight away. <laughs> but, you know, God spoke to me clearly through that. He said, son, I've used this to teach you something and the value of what you have learnt is greater than the value of what you have lost. Okay, we just can't always see it. We need to see when God is working in our lives, when He is working on us to make us like Jesus, part of the journey means a change in the, our perspective of things. See, God wants to take us from the carnal man, that self centered perspective that we have on our lives and the things around us, to a kingdom perspective, to the way that He sees things. And as we move towards that, as God takes us on that journey, we can then start to see things the way that God sees things and we can start to understand why God is maybe doing some stuff that may have appeared incomprehensible to us. When I was a kid, my parents made some decisions that I just couldn't fathom. Who's been in that? Oh, come on, there's a few more of you than that. That's the common human experience. But when I grew up, well, I was still growing up, but when I married and had children, I started to understand why my parents made some of the decisions that they did because I had a more adult, I had the perspective of a parent, not of a 10-year-old child. And God, we're on that journey with God. God is drawing us closer to him. He's making us more like Jesus and he's changing our perspective. Sometimes engaging in that changed perspective means admitting that we're wrong. Sometimes we don't want to change our perspective because we like the mess that we're already in. We're comfortable in the mess. And we don't want to change because it means something new and we're frightened of it. A number of years ago, Betty and I were in a church in Wagga and we had a guest speaker come through and, and this family came down to hear this guest speaker in our church uh, from another town outside of Wagga to uh, hear him speak. And he had the, the, the mother of the family, she was in a wheelchair, couldn't walk, hadn't walked for years. Came into the meeting, the meeting was a good meeting. At the end of the meeting there was an opportunity for prayer, for healing. This gentleman ha- has a healing, well he doesn't, well he's passed away now, but and he had a healing ministry and this lady went out the front, he prayed for her, this lady, she got up out of her chair, she walked around the building, she walked outside and walked around the building and walked for the rest of the night. When we saw her next Sunday, she was back in the wheelchair. Now, had God withdrawn his healing? I doubt it. That's not the God that I know. Never known God to withdraw a healing. But I believe the problem was, was that this lady was comfortable in the situation that she found herself in, in her family, in her home, where her husband and kids did things for her, and she was in the wheelchair, and she was comfortable... In that scenario, that she had that, that was worked out in her life. You know, when we get into a situation, doesn't matter how positive or negative it is, we make adjustments to it, we accommodate for it. And the thought of having to live life as a person that could walk instead of a person in the wheelchair was just too frightening to her. Right? To have to say, oh well, you know, I can't ask the kids to sweep, I'm gonna to have to sweep. 
Do you, do you know what I mean? Just that whole change of things. And sometimes when God does a work in our life and he lifts us up to the next thing, we have to let go and repent of the attitudes that we've held to engage with the new reality that God has got for us, the new place that he has for us so we can operate the way that he has called us to operate. See, God is with us. When we get ourselves in a mess, even if it's in a, a changed situation, something that we feel we can't cope with, because we have the Holy Spirit, he stands next to us and he says, I will help you do this, but you've got to let me do it. It's like uh, um, the last daily bread that I did. I, you know, I called it, Who Do You Trust? And I made the comment, I think, that uh, I had to learn to trust God in every situation. You know, the, the human instinct is, oh, I can do, do that myself. But the God instinct is to trust the Holy Spirit and ask him help to help you do it. Often we don't have the Holy Spirit's help in our life because we don't ask him. In, the James, in James it tells us you don't have stuff because you don't ask for it. I mean, how dumb is that? I was never shy of asking my parents for money. <laughs> When I was a kid, we need to not be shy of asking God to send his Holy Spirit to walk alongside us, to empower us, to do whatever it is that we've got to do. Even those changes that we might have to make in our life as God is at work in our life. So this, this evening, it's almost evening, isn't it? I just, uh, Christine, you might like to come and play, please. I just want you to take something from this. And the first thing is to remember to hold on to strongly that our righteousness comes through faith in Christ Jesus. No other way. That we don't need legalism to be born again, that we simply need faith in God. It, legalism doesn't make us righteous. If anything, it probably pushes us in the other direction because we're not... When we're trying to be righteous through legalism, we're trusting in works rather than trusting in God. And any efforts of our own are worthless in that regard anyhow. And only Jesus saves. And we need to follow him closely. I would invite you, if you don't already, when you're praying, when you're doing your devotion, or even just when you wake up in the morning, if you do your devotions later in the day, just say, Heavenly Father, I commit my day to you guide me in it. I commit my ways to you this morning in Jesus name. And as you make that your practice, God will do a work in your heart. He'll change your lives. He'll change your mind. God bless you all. Looking forward to seeing you at dinner at Slow after this. Thanks, Christine.